All right, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, Zoom Goes the History. This is one called When War Returns, and we'll be talking about how the hard hand of war um, doesn't just come to communities where they host battles, but rather the Civil War is not only fought in 10,000 places, it happens all over the place, and sometimes more than once, and sometimes it goes to a place and stays. But let me introduce my, our guests first, um, and we hope you'll share this uh, with your friends uh, as you watch this on YouTube or on Facebook. First, at least on my computer, upper left, I see Carol Reardon. Um, she is uh, the historical advisor to the president of the Gettysburg Foundation, longtime author, uh, fanatic of numerous battlefields, and, um, and uh, has worked alongside the military to help us use our battlefields and historic sites. We've got Brian uh, Cheeseboro here, who works at the National Archives and is on the board of the Alliance, Alliance to Protect uh, the Civil War Defenses of Washington. Uh, we've got my friend and colleague, Chris White, uh, down there, who is the Senior Education Manager at the American Battlefield Trust, also does a lot of work with emerging Civil War. You know him, at least usually behind the camera at a lot of our lives, and I hope you'll check out some of his work that we just did in West Virginia and Kentucky a few weeks ago. And last but not least, Chris Mikowski from Emerging Civil War, co-founder of that prolific author and my friend as well. You know, I just realized I didn't call Brian and Carol my friends, but I consider all of you my friends. I'm already getting in deep. So let me bail out here um, and pass it over to Carol about this war return subject. Do you have some thoughts on this? Whenever I teach my military history class, I always try to warn them on day one that it's not going to be one battle after another battle after another battle because Lord knows that's why half of them are there. Uh, I always lose a few right at that point because they really want the battle, battle, battle thing. But what I usually do at the very start is explain it like this. Soldiers engage in combat. Armies and generals uh, fight battles and con conduct campaigns, but nations and peoples go to war. And that's one of those things that um, I have to remind them about frequently. And I'm just basically re reiterating what, G what Gary led off with. When war returns, it can return in a lot of different ways and adopt a lot of different places and not just on battlefields. A long time ago when I was writing an article about the 148th Pennsylvania uh, up in Center County, right? Well, my former home at Penn State, I ran across a quotation in, in an editorial written by a um, newspaper editor in Belfont, Pennsylvania. It was right after the Battle of Antietam and he was reflecting on uh, how the nation has been adjusting to the, to the war of the last year and a half. And he wrote this, we are all in this war, those who fight and those who stay at home that their brethren may fight, those who give their hearts to the enemy and those, who heart, those whose heartstrings are lacerated by every ball that comes from a, from a rebel rifle. Well, it's one of those things that helps us to, re, to remember that war takes many forms, war touches many places. And with that, with that effort to hammer home that we're gonna go many places and do many things, there you go, Gary, where do you want us to go first? <laughs> well, before we go anywhere, let me ask Chris, Chris or Brian, um, if you have any additional thoughts on this. I think one of the things that's cool about this topic is, is we can talk about battles, we can talk about landscapes, we can talk about cities, we can talk about different types of populations, um, and we can talk about the evolution of war itself. Um, so, you know, when war comes back, it always has a slightly different face, a slightly different impact, always horrific, and it finds new ways to be horrific. And I think that as we peel some of those layers back today, we're going to find um, all these different ways that, that, that war continues to uh, really tear at the fabric of everything it touches. Good, guys. I really agree with that too, uh, Chris. And, you know, it's really interesting when, um, I want to thank you again, Gary, for inviting me to this uh, discussion. Um, and, and I've really been thinking a lot about brainstorming because um, there's so many ways that you can take this subject and really run with it. Um, we talked about, as you mentioned, uh, communities. And, and I was thinking about um, and looked up uh, some cases where the same family, uh, for instance, would have casualties within that family, that it keeps coming back. Um, uh, one famous case, of course, Ms. Mrs. Lincoln, she had um, uh, uh, members of her family who were in the Confederacy. And um, there were a couple of people, I think, who were killed there. Um, things like um, even a community. And, and we've heard stories about the casualty lists that keep coming after 
battles take place. Uh, I guess people go to the post office or whatever and see that. Um, so there's so many ways that you can really brainstorm with this topic. Good. Chris might remember that not too long ago, we were at the Adams County Historical Society and the National Civil War Museum. And there are actually, there are subscription based uh, sort of publications where people are paying to get a subscription to a, a periodic list of where, uh, of who is in that particular hospital. I mean, imagine going through this as a community and trying to figure out where your loved ones and your community members fought and not being able to simply look it up or not be able to simply access that information. You don't know which hospitals they're at. You didn't know where they fought exactly. And suddenly they're all over the place. You're trying to figure these things out. Um, and, and I do want to sort of start, and I'm going to give it over to Chris White here, with, with this idea of communities. Chris Mikowski noted that you know, we might talk about communities. We might talk about camps. We'll certainly talk about occupations, battles, um, and the sort of broad, you know, scarred countryside of war. But let me just start with, you know, one of Chris's favorites, and that is, you know, a place where war returned more than once, and that's Fredericksburg or any community that might be on your mind, Chris. Yeah, I, I think Fredericksburg, you know, gets kind of put into one little uh, bucket, if you will, for the Civil War. You know, everyone thinks that it's Maurice Heights and Ambrose Burnside, and it's one attack after another after another on December 13th, 1862, and that's really not the case at all. You know, war is not just mud and blood and bullets. It's, it's going to be taking all shapes and, and sizes and different forms. You know, Fredericksburg is an interesting um, case study because the Union Army comes there for the first time in March of 1862, which most people uh, completely forget about. And there's an occupation of the city. There are military actions there. Um, but when the war comes, um, you know, the city is taken over by the, the Union forces. And it's very interesting to see, you know, we don't really have major fighting around there. You do have the Peninsula Campaign taking place at the same time. You have the Valley Campaign taking place at the same time. But what's going on in Fredericksburg is really going to be a struggle within a community. Um, and that struggle is, is going to be, you know, these 5,020 people who live there in the city of Fredericksburg now having to deal with a union occupying force of about 40,000. Half of those people who are in Fredericksburg are... Uh, slaves, and they are going to take this opportunity, many of them, for self-emancipation. They're going to go across the Rappahannock River, which is their Rubicon of sorts, and they're going to free themselves because they have this Union Army there for their protection. And keep in mind, this is well before the Emancipation Proclamation is even uh, coming into form as we know it. So you have this community already transforming because you have not only, um, you know, these slaves moving across the Rappahannock River, you're losing your economic base. You're also losing your wealth as they go across the river. Uh, and now Fredericksburg's been changed and there really hasn't been too many shots fired around it. Um, and it's interesting to see what will end up happening. These Union soldiers will spread out into the countryside. There's great accounts of it, like the 24th New York. Um, we'll talk about these, these um, people trying to come into their lines at night and they're usually, they'll, they'll call them contrabands and the, the um, primary documents. But one of my favorite accounts will be um, this slave who's trying to self-emancipate himself. And he comes up to the Union lines near Marie's Heights. And um, the Union guards call out the challenge three times. The guy doesn't know what the challenge uh, code would be. And they fire into the night and they see what they describe as a black man fleeing from these men firing at them. Luckily, they're not very good shots, but they hear a thud in the night. When the, when the sun comes up the next morning, they're going to walk out and they find a man in the fetal position. He's alive with a big scar on his head. He had run square into a tree trying to get away from the Union Army who were trying to shoot at him. Um, and with soldiers humor, they said, don't worry, the tree was OK. Uh, but this man they picked up, brought back into to Union lines and he's now free. So you already have this changing, uh, um, you know status within in Fredericksburg. And by the time the Civil War is over, um, Spotsylvania County and Fredericksburg will lose half of its wartime population. It will also lose half of its economy and it will take to the 1950s for that population to reach what it was in 1860. And it'll take the 1950s for um, the economy to come back to where it was um, prior to the war. And I know we'll get more into Fredericksburg, but you know they haven't even fired a shot in the first battle of Fredericksburg, the second battle of Fredericksburg, or the third battle of Fredericksburg. And yes, there was a third one. Um, and now you already have this, this changing uh, of a community um, there at Fredericksburg. And war is going to stay there from March of 1862 in some forms all the way into the Overland Campaign in May of 1864. 
And I had mentioned earlier about how war itself changes. Chris talks about that 18 month window when the army first shows up for occupation in, in March of, of 62, the war looks entirely different than it does when Grant marches through the area in 64. Um, the, the tactics that are used in the field, the type of medical treatment that soldiers get behind the lines, um, interactions between the armies, between civilian populations, it's all different. And so um, war itself has evolved when it comes back. Good. And Another yeah. thing too, um, since you mentioned, Chris, um, uh, March 1862, Fredericksburg, uh, I was really glad to hear you say that because um, that's also been written about with um, David Blight's book, A Slave No More. And uh, he writes about two uh, men, one of them, John Washington, who was one of those who escaped in March, 1862. Uh, and uh, when the first occupation of Fredericksburg by the, by the Yankees. Um, another thing that comes to mind is, as you mentioned, and you're right, there is a third Fredericks, uh, uh, a second Fredericksburg actually in May of 1863. And um, I'm, I imagine everyone here is familiar with that photograph of the stone wall at Fredericksburg with a trench behind it. And there's like one dead soldier there or whatever, maybe it's a, somebody live posing or whatever, uh, and the house in the background. That's actually from taken in May of 1863, but many people may think, oh, that's December 1862 and whatever, but it's actually uh, May 1863. Good, Carol? Thinking, just thinking about Fredericksburg though, it's 50 miles roughly between uh, Washington, 50 miles to Richmond. It's in the paths of the two armies. Um, I, when I first took a look at the, at the su subjects we were supposed to con consider, I'm sitting here in Gettysburg. And the place I immediately began to think about was a place that did not expect to find itself uh, under Confederate attack or in the path of the armies at all. And that's our, my neighbor just 25 miles up the road at Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Talk about a place where war returned, where they didn't even think that they would even have this issue to deal with. Um, the war returns there three times in three different forms. You have a fairly traditional cavalry raid by Jeb Stuart in the fall of 62. You have the entire army of Northern Virginia passing through in, uh, the, in June of 63. And then John McCausland stops by with a lot of torches in, in, the, in late July of 64. Here's a community that isn't in the line of, of, of March of the Armies does not expect to see war, but war keeps coming to them unbidden and with horrible consequences and with no way to fight back. This isn't a battle per se. Um, this is something that, that's a very different kind of thing. It adds an element to this war that we just don't study enough. This is all to say nothing, thanks Carol, about the fact that even if the soldiers, even if camps, even if hospitals really never were set up in your town, you probably sent soldiers from your town. I mean, the towns are impacted, even if the war doesn't really come to you, so to speak, the bad news comes back to you. Um, I wanna, you know, I know we'll talk more about Fredericksburg and I know that makes Chris and Chris <laughs> happy as clams, uh, but just this idea that Chris uh, White led with, you know, when the union was on Marie's Heights, I'll bet you a lot of people didn't even know that, wait. You know, people watching today, I thought the Union was repulsed from Marie's Heights because they might not know about the second, let alone the third, Battle of Fredericksburg or of the Union Field Hospitals up there or anything like that. So that's interesting. And we can't cover all these communities, but when I think about towns being revisited by war, I think on, on a lot of you all, y'all watching, um, Winchester has to come to mind, which if I say it changed hands 72 times on Facebook, someone will say 74. No, somebody will say 140. No, somebody will say 250. It's like the number of books Chris Mikowski writes every year or something like that. So, um, you know, so, so, so I don't even know where to come down on that, but certainly war returns to Winchester, uh, to Harper's Ferry, where I don't think the war ever left, but it changed hands at least six times. I've heard people say 22 times, depending on what you count as actually changing hands. But like Carol mentioned, um, you know, Chambersburg, I like to always talk about Hampton, Virginia, which was burned by the Confederates in 1861. Um, it's near Fort, Fort Monroe. Uh, and you know they did not want the Union coming out with all these contrabands and, and using the town. They burned their own town only within the coming years to have you know, former slaves, contrabands come and set up sort of what's called slab town in the ruins of their former masters, you know, uh, chimneys and, and whatnot, and make a city out of it. It's a sad story. It eventually would revert back um, to the original owners, and, and we can talk about whether that's appropriate or not, but 
talk about war returning in a different way. The soldiers came through, uh, they, they fell back, the Confederates burned it, the contraband sort of moved in, made their own town, and then it you know, rubber banded back. Other thoughts about communities? I think people forget that there's a wake of these armies coming through. Yeah, you'll have this, this surge, this tidal wave, we'll call that a battle, but then you'll have this wake of them moving through an area uh, and you have the, the tail end of these armies and, and, you know, what's going to be following behind them, you know, Sherman through, through Georgia, you'll have, you know, tens of thousands of newly free peoples who are trying to, you know, find a new life for themselves. Hampton's a perfect example up in uh, the Virginia area. So you start to, you start to deal with this more. There's, there's, you know, the logistical side of war, which doesn't always get the the light on it uh, that it should is a very important end of things. And you, when you start talking about logistics, um, you have to feed an army. Now you're talking about having to feed, you know, newly free people who are behind you. You're potentially having to feed a civilian population. Uh, jumping back to Fredericksburg, it's so devastated by the first battle of Fredericksburg, not only by the Union, but by the Confederates, too, um, that there's actually a push in the North and the South, a uh, unified effort to raise money, to send money there to, to help them out. So you start to, to, to see this. You also start to have that uncertainty in places like uh, a Chambersburg or Winchester or Romney, like who's coming back and what are they going to do? Um, you know, one of my favorite stories during McClausland's 64 raid after Chambersburg is the civil war within his command when he goes down to Cumberland and Hancock and starts talking about, hey, let's burn some of these Maryland towns. And Bradley Johnson, who's from Maryland and there's Maryland troops, there's Confederate Maryland troops saying, whoa, 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 that's not what we signed up for. We're not burning our own state. What are you talking about, you crazy man? Um, and it's probably lucky that, that uh, Averill shows up at Moorfield to run him off because potentially McClausen's going to start burning towns in that area. Um, so, you know, it's not only that you're dealing with a, a, an enemy force, if you will, you're starting to deal with some problems. The Confederates in, in Fredericksburg after the first battle are like, all right, great, the Yankees are gone. Now we're stuck with these Mississippians who they start calling lice because they can't get rid of these guys and they start breaking the windows in the churches and they have some problems down there. So, you know, both sides will bring bring problems um, sometimes into the north, sometimes into the south. But it, it's it's an interesting fact that the wakes of these armies are, um, you know, there is always going to be some sort of a collateral damage that you don't always know. Uh, that's not as straightforward as a cannon shot coming through your house. I think and, about and speaking of, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was going to say, and I think about the way that when when an army is in a place, and the way that ripples out across the countryside too. Uh, you know, thinking about Rosecrans in Murfreesboro, and to you know, he's there for six months as he's trying to rebuild his army, and in doing so, he spreads that army out across the countryside, putting in fortifications to protect his infrastructure, as Chris talks about. Um, and so, there's suddenly this huge federal presence all throughout central Tennessee. And then even when he begins to move down um, toward uh, Chattanooga, that that wake that Chris talks about gets wider, just like a boat wake, you know? And, and so it gets wider and, and, and really starts to consume so much of what's behind. Uh, and that, that's, you know, huge implications. Brian, I'm sorry, Chris, step that, that, That's okay. Um, no, um, speaking of communities, another place that comes to mind is uh, Frederick, Maryland. Uh, not Fredericksburg, Frederick, Maryland. Um, and uh, what comes to mind from that, of course, is that famous uh, photograph of Confederates on, uh, I think it's, uh, I want to say Market Street. Market. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, they're, they're, they're in, behind that sign, that Rosenstock sign, and it's taken from a window. And um, what's neat about that to me is um, it, it's actually one of the very few photographs of Confederates in the field, so to speak, uh, I understand. But um, that there's a debate about whether that photo was taken in September 1862 or July 1864. Um, first date being with the Maryland campaign, second date with the Valley campaign of 1864. I'm actually rooting for the second um, case um, because of that Valley campaign is kind of near and dear to my heart. But um, that, that's just uh, uh, an interesting case. And certainly you can imagine um, there probably was the situation of those soldiers maybe coming back to that same place, even if a photograph wasn't taken in 1864. Here we are again, sort of thing. And they may have been literally the same soldiers because in the first time it was sort of Stonewall Jackson's troops and the second time it was Jubal Early and there's a lot of overlap there. So I think that's a really good point, Brian. 
Um, everybody, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're talking about when war returns. And wow, we haven't talked about battlefields yet. This trust does work to preserve battlefields, but our educational efforts are, are, are much broader. We know that not everybody is into the military movements and you really can't understand a war, the Rev War 1812, uh, the Civil War, without understanding all the surrounding contexts. And a big part of that is the communities and the countryside in which it's fought. Um, I do want to move on next and I'll lead with Carol into these ideas of sort of camps and occupations, you know, whether it be Randy Station, New Orleans, we'll get back to Falmouth, Virginia, you know, Fredericksburg itself, um, you know, and all these other places. So Carol, any of these come to mind? Um, I, actually, when I, when you were mentioning occupations, I was thinking about the work one of my uh, graduate students did. And he was focusing on uh, some of the towns in Mississippi. And he, he wrote an awful lot about Natchez. I don't know if he ever uh, published it or anything of the sort. Um, he decided to go off in another direction without completing the dissertation, but he had this incredible amount of wonderful research. And one of the things that struck me about his research on Natchez was that whenever uh, an army of occupation came, arrived, uh, oftentimes they would try to find one or two locals with whom they could work, but those locals had to be very careful as well not to appear to be collaborating. You had to find a way to um, make, make sure that the people were not being overly um, abused by the occupiers and the occupiers had to accomplish their own military mission. And it could sometimes create an interesting new dynamic where perhaps the political leaders of a town going into uh, the war uh, really can't fill these, fill these roles. And in Natchez, it turned out to be uh, a local Catholic priest who had really no public visibility before all this happened, but uh, found himself being the mediator, basically, between the um, Union occupiers and the residents of Natchez uh, in order to take care of just simple things like making sure that food supplies arrived and taking care of any um, issues of law and order and things like that. Uh, an awful lot of things can't be scripted when you come to occupations because there will be a natural tendency to have conflict between the occupiers and the leaders of the occupied. Sometimes there has to be an intermediary. And in this case, it was a, the interesting personage of a Catholic priest who stepped in. But I guess because I'm sitting here in Gettysburg and love and life, live and large in Gettysburg, um, I have to think about Gettysburg is a place being occupied in its own strange way after the battle. And in that case, you know, we have the thousands and thousands of wounded soldiers who have to be taken care of. The town was only 2,400 um, in population at the time. And there were at least right after the battle, 10 times as many wounded to be taken care of. We also had all the uh, individuals, all the, all the local residents throughout Adams County who were um, displaced by the war because the battles had uh, ebbed and flowed across their farms. Our good friends over at the Adams County Historical Society have a wonderful collection of um, almost unparalleled collection of civilian accounts of what this place was like and how much outside help had to come to help Adams County just keep on continue, uh, keep continuing. Uh, we have wonderful accounts now of the United States Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission, especially the Sanitary Commission. And the work of a very much understudied group, um, a lot of times they would be called state agents who showed up, mostly to keep an eye on uh, the care of the wounded from their home state. But sometimes they would just represent a community and come down with baskets of goodies sent from small town Michigan to try to find some Michigan wounded. And the story that we're beginning to put together for uh, the six months after the Battle of Gettysburg, when there is an occupation of sort, there is a, um, a provost marshal here, there are some Union troops here, but the whole effort, civilian and military, um, gave this whole place a rhythm of life very much unlike anything they experienced before the war. And finally, we'll be able to move beyond about six months or so after the war. Absolutely fascinating stuff, but it's part of the war. The war came here and it didn't leave for quite some time. It wasn't just July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. 
I think that's what a lot of people forget. There's usually a second invasion or a second battle after a battle, and that will be the do-gooders coming in, and sometimes the charlatans to come in to take advantage of, of people. But now you have this influx of people who are going to try to help communities. Gettysburg is a perfect example of, you know, not only do you have to support these tens of thousands of wounded soldiers now, now you have all these do-gooders who are starting to come in, and they also have to eat, they have to sleep somewhere, and they have to be be cared for as well, even as they're trying to care for those soldiers. I think that's something that, that folks – kind of forget about we could probably even talk about a third wave of the tourists who come afterwards scope yeah. even as the war is going on but certainly you know gettysburg is a destination today because of the war so in some ways there's still that uh invasion that's going on as people go to revisit that ground i thought it was a destination because it's gary's favorite place on earth and everyone just wants to get <laughs> but it, you know it, it also brings up a, a good point with to a little bit off of what Carol was saying, you know, some of these places are are going to have the war come to them because they're strategic and not just in the Civil War. Look at New Orleans during 1812 and the Civil War, Pensacola during the Rev War, Civil War and 1812, Baltimore, 1812 and um, the, the uh, Civil War. I mean, Washington more in the Civil War than it was important in 1812. It's more symbolic, but you start having these places that, yeah, you're living there strategically. You're stuck there because this is a capital of one of the nations or it's a rail center where it, it, it's on the Mississippi River, like Vicksburg or Chattanooga, or Chattanooga for all, a rail center. Uh, but you you also have the problem um, that people start to figure out as the war goes on. And that is that, um, you know, like at Winchester, people are like, oh, we love Stonewall Jackson. This guy's great. Let's have Stonewall Jackson here. Guess what? When you have Stonewall Jackson right there, that means that you're going to have three federal armies trying to take him on. Um, one person said, to paraphrase, that, that Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, um, was more safe and secure when Lee's army was not there because, you know, Lee's army is the target as well as Richmond. So it makes it a doubly enticing target to come down here and attack it like you'll see in 62 and 64. Um, so it's interesting to see whenever these armies do come back, sometimes it's because there's another army there. And those those folks over time will realize, man, let's get these guys out of here. We don't we don't need them here. They keep coming back to places like Richmond or to Fredericksburg, as Carol said. It's 55 miles from Richmond. It's 50 miles from Washington. I call it the front line of war, the front line of emancipation, because it really is for a long time. Uh, the front line between the Union and Confederacy, the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers. I mean, that is really going to be the northernmost boundary for, you know, about 18 months throughout the war. So it's interesting to see it from those perspectives as well. And to kind of play on that, that, that infrastructure that supports those towns, those railroads, those rivers, and those roads, um, you can almost predict where the armies are going to end up. So when we talk about an occupying force, uh, when the, the Army of the Potomac occupies Stafford in the winter of 62-63, it's because they've got railroads that are going to be able to supply them. Um, same in the, the winter of 63, 64, as they've been maneuvering through the fall up and down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Eventually, winter's going to come and they're going to have to stop somewhere along that railroad because they're going to need that railroad to supply the army over the course of the winter. Um, and so uh, those logistical factors that Chris mentioned are really key in determining where these occupations take place. Chattanooga takes place because it's at the end of a railroad and it leads into a railroad uh, deep into to Georgia. Uh, and so it's easy to kind of look at a map and say like, okay, snow is falling. These guys are here on this railroad. And that's where the occupation then unfolds. Ryan, I saw you trying to break in, I think. Um, I, one thing I did think about too is uh, um, something that's mentioned about tourism, I guess. Um, and uh, recently I, um, my family and I, we took a little vacation um, just down to uh, Prince William County uh, Woodridge, if you call that a vacation, and uh, we went to old, old town Occoquan and such. But we also um, discovered the Bristow Station battlefield, uh, and that was a neat place because um, they had a few things. Um, there wasn't a visitor center that I saw, but um, they did have a reproduction of Winter Quarters, which I thought was really cool. Um, and also, um, when you take the trail, there was one point where we kind of went off the trail and went into a, a clearing in the woods and there was a Confederate cemetery there. Um, basically the story I guess about Bristow Station is in the first winter of the war, it was a Confederate camp, um, talking about camps. And then um, it was also really uh, amazing, just a, it was a lot of disease there that broke out. Um, I've been thinking a lot about disease 
and the Civil War, um, it was its own pandemic, if you will, um, like we're dealing with now, the Civil War was. And then um, in 1863, um, there's the Battle of Bristow Station after Gettysburg, um, you know, Meade still trying to go after Lee before Mine Run. Um, so there's the battle that takes place there as well. So, so it's interesting to kind of see this one place with these different events going on. Um, the Confederate camp in 1861, 62, uh, and the cemetery that remains from it. There's no headstones or anything, but um, there, there were good placards there that were in good shape, and they did have the names of the Confederate soldiers that were buried there. So, um, and also, uh, as you go around the trail, it's a big circle, huge field, and there's all the placards telling the whole story of the battle that takes place in 1863. Uh, so th that's great. First of all, I want to comment on the vacation thing. That sounds like more of a vacation for you, Brian, than it did for your family. <laughs> well, we familiar. went kayaking too. So okay. let me let me also mention that we did kayaking. But my wife and I, we um, I guess do a pretty good job of well, what do you want to do, what I want to do. So um, and you know, they love to walk too. So uh, good. Uh, so you also mentioned that the trust, of course, you, the members of the trust, supporters have helped us to preserve uh, uh, most of the acreage, if not all. Um, at Bristow Station, along with our partners, we have some good friends at Prince William County. Look for our live videos that we've shot um, at Bristow. And, and while you're at it, every place that we're talking about today, and I mean every, uh, we have content on our website to support that um, with previous lives, with maps, photos, articles, and animated maps, which brings me into what I wanted to talk about before we move on to battles themselves. Of course, this is only known as a battle, and that is Vicksburg. Um, you know, Carol had already mentioned you know, Natchez, Mississippi, and some of these other Mississippi towns. But I mean, imagine for Vicksburg, we think of it, you know, as a, you know, a, as it ended up, right, after this siege and after this terrible time and the civilians are starving and eating rats. But remember before that, that they are under Confederate occupation. You know how happy they must have been every time they, you know, repulsed one of Grant's attempted efforts, you know, in late 62 and into early, you know, 63. And then all of a sudden they're almost starved out and then they're occupied by a Union force for the rest of the war. Um, I mean, you talk about um, when war returns, that returns in a much different way you can watch our Vicksburg animated map to understand that place a little bit better. Um, yeah, me I mean, it's one of those deals where I'm, I'm sorry, I would just have to say like, all right, Grant, try to take it once. Yeah, that's cool. Twice. Mm, it's getting a little worrisome. Three times. I'm out of Dodge. I want to leave here. I mean, I know it's easier said than done sometimes, but like if I'm living in Romney, Winchester, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, Nashville, like, hmm, they're coming back a lot of times. Maybe I need to go find another. Maybe I need to pull Wilmer McLean and, and move out Ken Burns style and uh, head out to, to Appomattox because we all know that's that's right. the way to go. <laughs> I think about Vicksburg, like, you know, the war tries to come and tries to return, you know, seven times Grant tries to get there. And I could see how folks in Vicksburg are thinking like, okay, he's never going to get here. I'm feeling invincible. And then once he finally shows up on the edge of the city, it's like, oh, a little too late to pack up and move now. Um, <laughs> you know, and so maybe it led to a false sense of security because it took him so long to get there. Um, That's a good point, Chris, because there is a false sense of security. I mean, wh when the Union Army arrives for the second time at Fredericksburg, yeah, I'm going back to beat that dead horse, Gary. But when they arrive for the second time, you know, the, a lot of civilians leave. They're like, oh, man. But then they sit there for almost three weeks and they're like, OK, maybe there's not going to be a battle. So they come back to their home and where they're comfortable. And then, you know, a, a tragedy strikes with the Union Army bombarding it and then sacking the city and the Confederates bombarding the city and then having to occupy it for an extended period of time. So, you know, it, it is interesting to see. And I know it's easier said than done to, to get out of the way of an army um, to pick up and, and move. But you know, you, you do have to question after a while why some folks did and who had the means did stay in, in some of these the, these places. It's, it's a tough call, I know. I've always thought that some of the most evocative uh, contemporary artwork of the Gettysburg campaign are the uh, pen and ink sketches, just the, uh, the, the woodcuts of residents of, say, the Chambersburg area, um, Franklin County, um, trying to get away from the approaching Confederate army and, and taking everything that they can carry uh, either on, on a horse or in a cart or even by hand and heading off to the safety of Harrisburg. If you uh, take a look at them very closely, the artist has gone to fairly great pains to uh, put emotion on those faces. They aren't just uh, blank faces or stock faces. You can see the terror in their eyes. You can, 
there, there's something very evocative about those specific uh, pieces of artwork that ca really captured the moment far more than a lot of the other things we see from that time period. Uh, for Northerners, it was a unique experience. And so I think um, that, yeah, they, they really um, resonated here, here in, in the Northern states, but it was far more common experience for Southerners. I yeah, and that's a great point because a lot of the regimental histories in the Gettysburg campaign, talking about the 12th Corps, the 1st Corps, the 11th Corps coming to Gettysburg, they're talking about this exodus. They see these people. There are great descriptions. There. That's a great, great point, Carol. And, you know, it's it's probably easier for the enslaved population who are picking up in, in the wake of, of Sherman's army to say, man, this is an easy choice. Here's freedom. Let, let's go. What these folks who have an established home and in, in these places, uh, north or south, it's probably a harder decision to make. Sorry, Chris. No, no. I, and, and uh, you know, that gets me thinking about Gary's comment about Winchester earlier. And, and um, what does it take? What What's the mindset of someone who stays put and has to weather the constant presence and the constant fighting and what makes them stay? Why do they have to stay? Um, that's a really, I think, important takeaway for us to think about today, because those are really hard questions. I've always this thought. also makes me think about the situation of um, African Americans who are in uh, the North, for instance, and every time um, the Confederate armies, Maryland campaign, Gettysburg campaign, Valley campaign come North, uh, what they end up doing. Um, I've certainly heard of stories of people um, having to uh, escape on their own to keep from being uh, kidnapped. Um, but unfortunately, you know, of course, that does happen. Uh, it happens at Harpers Ferry in 1862, happens in Pennsylvania in 1863. I've, I've been really curious as to if maybe any of you might, might know if there's any cases of anyone, of any uh, uh, Blacks being captured in 1864 with the Valley Campaign and into Maryland and into D.C. and everything. I, I don't know of any yet. But um, that's another thing that I've also thought about, what, what the war means for them every time it comes back to them in the north. Gary, I, I have just one last kind of um, observation about this occupation. I, I kind of keep thinking about Chattanooga, where there's this forced occupation after Chickamauga and the Confederates bottle the Union Army up in Chattanooga. They don't completely seal the Union Army off, but because of that occupation, the city itself undergoes tremendous strains. The, the civilians who live there go uh, through, through terrible depredations. The enslaved population is in terrible shape in, because the Confederates force that occupation to happen. When the Cracker Line finally starts to break things open and the Grant finally breaks out of there, the army still stays over the course of the winter in that whole region. But um, to me, that's a that's a real interesting twist on this notion of occupation in that the Confederates sort of inflict this occupation on their own citizens. Yeah. And let me. Um, so first of all, if you're watching and you're with the American Battlefield Trust, we're talking about when war comes and doesn't leave or when war returns. And we are about to get to battles, I swear. But if any of you know of any of these 1864 instances that Brian was mentioning, put those in the comments so we can, you know, look into those. That, that'd be very interesting. Um, and Chris, you brought on to, you know, I, I, for a coming little mini soliloquy from me, I was going to bring up Chattanooga because, first of all, it was a put under enormous strain, strain. But it also, like Washington and like a lot of other towns, came to be what they become later during the Civil War. When the armies are there, they're flooded with new people, new businesses, new money, and everything like that. Now, I'm not saying Vicksburg in June of 1863 was experiencing a big boom, but a lot of these places really did benefit from war, as do countries when they are often at war, economically at least. And one of the things that comes along with the armies occupying a place um, are, of course, photographs. Okay? And you brought up Chattanooga, one of the most photographed places of the Civil War. The most photographed, Washington and Richmond. What do those have in common? They're capital cities, but they're also constant, under constant military activity during the Civil War. Another place, and I still want to talk about it, you know, is Brandy Station, definitely in the top five as well, and Charleston, almost all of which photos were created, you know, the lion's share of which photos were created in 1865 after the Union came in and allowed access to the Union photographers. So um, this, this manner of this, this growth of city being documented actually during the Civil War prolifically through photography is, of course, something I like to, uh, you know, focus on. But also, it also shows that when the armies stay for a while, things change. And that is where people really radiated to 
Um, and Brandy Station, I'll just close with, you know, Bud Hall often says, it is the most camped upon, tramped upon, marched upon, and fought over land in United States military history. We could argue about that. That could be its own Zoom um, if we wanted to, but uh, that makes a pretty good case. That place is constantly under the gun for three years. I think now we it's time for all of the panelists to check their pool. It took Gary 35 minutes to do photography. Uh, so whoever had that on their check mark, you win the pool for today. I always take the under with him in photography. Usually it's like 12 seconds or less. But I know. Yeah. I had 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, photographs are good. And there's no well, it, it, bad press. It, and it's interesting because, you know, for Petersburg getting into actually some battles here for you and Richmond and, and some of these other places, you can follow the economic recovery of these places from the Civil War right down the 95 corridor. It's actually fascinating to see, um, you know, the Fredericksburg, it's the 1940s and 50s. You can take those photographs that you're talking about, Gary, and you can focus in in this April of 1863 panoramic view of, of Fredericksburg and you can see where the Union and Confederacy bombarded. Um, and that is where today, if you drive through Fredericksburg, you start from south, go to north, you'll be in a beautiful colonial era um, community. Then you get to the center of the city and it's all from the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 50s, north end of the city. That's going to be colonial. And that's where the you can see where the impact of that bombardment was, because that's how long it's going to take for this place to rebuild. And that's what was destroyed. Petersburg's another example of you can go through there. You have this this um, 292 day siege, though some people say it's a siege and some people say it's not a siege. But regardless of what you say. Petersburg is going to see war for so long, but then you go down through the town and you can see where these buildings had been burned. You know, there's a row house, row house, no row house. It hasn't been rebuilt since 1864, 65, moved down, down the line. Richmond was the same way. I mean, it economically starts to truly recover in the 1970s and 80s. And then Petersburg, if you go down to Petersburg today, you know, parts of that city still show the scarring of a war of 150 plus years ago, you know, and these armies came to Richmond multiple times. For obvious reasons, Petersburg, because as Chris said, you know, you have railroads there and you could just pick it out on a map like, yep, that's going to be important. Um, and you start to see that out of Vicksburg, too, with that, the extended um, siege operations and things out there. You know, these are places that it's like, you know, you, you envision one thing, then you get there and you're like, wow, this really the, the war had a long term impact here. And especially the multitude of battles that took place around it um, to get you onto the battlefield there, Gary. Good. Another yeah. place like you're mentioning um, uh, with Vicksburg and and uh, uh, Richmond, even another place that comes to mind to me for me is Charleston um, and just the war that keeps coming back there. Char uh, Fort Sumter, of course, with its symbolic value of this is where the war started. Um, and uh, of course, when many think of Charleston, they may think of uh, made famous, of course, by the movie Glory, um, the Battle of Fort Wagner. But many may not know that that's actually the second. Fort Wagner. So there you go again, comes back or keeps coming Good. back. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of these battles, if we're going to move on to battles now, you know, I mean, when people think about when war returns, I'll bet you that 80% of you, nah, more than half of you are thinking about Manassas, first bull run, second bull run, first battle of Manassas, second battle. Of Manassas. And while I'm at it, first Manassas battle, if, well, sorry, there's a million ways to do it that people different descri describe it differently. But I would say that only about 10%, maybe 15% of that battlefield actually overlaps. They're both fought outside Manassas, and a little bit of it is fought similarly on Chin Ridge and along the Sudley Road and whatnot. But uh, there's not a whole lot of that battlefield that overlaps, actually. I might say some of the same, and I'm probably going to rankle two people in particular. I don't want to say which, but they're both named Chris. Um, you know, with Chancellorsville in the wilderness, too, obviously in the same wilderness. But, you know, show me how much of the ground of the exact same ground is actually fought over. Um, so let's talk about this. I'll actually show you some ground that the trust preserved. So, <laughs> I agree, but is it is it ten percent of those battles? Is it five percent? Is it? Um, so I, I, I'm interested, and in, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe that's not any sort of a measurement. But but y'all for the group, you know, what sort of battlefields do we want to talk about where war returns? I have one in mind, and maybe one of y'all will get it first. I was going to say, all right, Gettysburg boy, we don't always come back to the same little village that you love. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you do have Chancellorsville and Wilderness, which are uh, one in the same in many, many regards. Um, there's a lot more marching during Wilderness uh, over the old Chancellorsville battleground than there was fighting over it. But, you know, people would come in and say, I'm looking for the Battle of the Wilderness, meaning Chancellorsville, and they, they would 
get it uh, messed up. But you have Fredericksburg with first and second Fredericksburg right there at Maurice Heights. Um, but of course, you have the fighting around Gaines's Mill and Cold Harbor, um, which will bring the fighting legitimately right over some of the same exact ground, um, you know, around the, the Richmond area. And then, you know, of course you have first and second Kernstown. I'm giving a shout out there to Chris Mikowski uh, for his Stonewall Jackson love and his first defeat there in the Valley. You're welcome, Chris. Um, and you, you have, you know, Chattanooga. Chattanooga actually has, you know, a, an initial very minor battle before it falls. And then you have the, the, the siege. So, I mean, there's a lot of places that you can, you know, you could throw a rock and hit a battlefield like Romney um, and places like that. Good. Y'all? Corinth? Go ahead. No, I, I saw in, in the notes that you sent that uh, you had the Battle of Corinth, Mississippi, or Corinth. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Is that the battle you're thinking of? No, no, I, Chris already got mine. I'm thinking Gaines's Mill and Cold Harbor because actually the first Corinth one, the May 1862 one, is really more of a siege that never really even materialized. You know, Beauregard realized he was done and left. Um, and then there's an actual battle there, of course, in October of 1862. Um, but, but to me, I mean, Gaines's Mill, Cold Harbor, you know, so that's June 27th, 1862, and June, I don't know, May 31st to June 12th. 1864. I mean, that battlefield overlaps by, you know, 30, 40, maybe 50 percent, you know, of the whole thing. It's got the largest attack of the entire Civil War. Gaines is mill with 50,000 soldiers. It's got one of the most famous attacks of the Civil War, the June 3rd massive movement of 20,000 soldiers over the same ground where the Gaines is mill charge took place. You know, um, so so I, you know, to me, you know, pound for pound, I don't know of another place that was more fought over in two conflagra conflagrations, terrible battles. I mean, there are a lot of other places where there were little battles fought numerous times. It's not just, you know, those places. I mean, you know, again, you look at Brandy Station at Fleetwood Hill, there are numerous skirmishes and whatnot going on over there. Um, the Gettysburg stuff that Chris is expecting me to bring up, I mean, you know, really, it's ransomed on June 26, 63. There's a massive battle there um, in early uh, July. I think that's when it was. And before and after that, there are tents and, you know, camps and raising troops and whatnot. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know of anything else that really compares to, uh, to this Gaines's Mill Cold Harbor. Carol? No, I, I, on one of my very first tours down there, uh, very, uh, a long time ago, I was impressed by how close the Gaines Mill Battlefield Park is that we always visit and the Cold Harbor Visitor Center. They're so close together physically that sometimes it's almost difficult to trans transfer from 1862 to 64 in that short a space. It doesn't seem like it should be like that, except for the fact it is. And I think that always stayed with me because one of the articles, uh, you know, I come from the publisher parish world and uh, some of you may have seen, and this is not shameless um, self-promotion because I'm not the author. Some of you may have seen this book, Lens of War. It's a photography book, Gary, just for you. Yeah, and if I may, Carol, I, I've always been a little perturbed that I was not invited to do an essay for that, so I'm so glad you shared. Uh, let, <laughs> yeah, let me repeat, I was not the editor. <laughs> yeah, if you're talking shameless self-promotion, Carol, you got Chris Mikowski on here. I That's mean, right. No I, don't, I don't need to promote because Gary promotes for me. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. But one of the things we were asked to do, and, and this might be an interesting thing for all of you listening to do, close your eyes. And I'll just say the word Civil War photograph. Now, what just popped into your head? What is the photograph that somewhere along the line you saw that just captured your imagination so completely that you've never gotten it out, out of your head? Well, that was basically the way the challenge was presented to me. And I don't know what it says about me, but this was the photograph that came to mind. Now, all of you have seen this photograph. I'm going to bet it's a picture of... Uh, the dead being, the soldier dead being disinterred from the Cold Harbor battlefield um, shortly at, at the war's end with the idea that those remains would be put into new national cemeteries and have a, uh, ha have a bit of closure for those soldiers, a more fitting end than just being buried on the battlefield. Now, one of the things that intrigued me when I was writing the, the piece that goes with the photograph was trying to figure out, you know, what about the families back at home who really know nothing about what happened to their loved ones and didn't get any immediate closure. 
and uh, track down a couple of the soldiers who would be picked up off the Cold Harbor battlefield and buried in the Cold Harbor Cemetery. But even then it dawned on me, wait a minute, there was a second battle there. How are we sure that these remains in that photograph are Cold Harbor soldiers? Maybe they're Gaines Mill soldiers. We, at the time, we didn't have a whole lot of insight on exactly where that photograph was taken, but that memory that those battlefields were so close had stuck with me for so long that I actually put a little piece in there saying, you know, there's an outside chance that some of these remains might be Gaines Mill remains. And so I wanted to find a representative soldier to uh, represent the Gaines Mill casualties. I picked one by the name of Daniel Reardon, just because I happened to find one uh, with, with my, my same last name from a Massachusetts regiment. Probably not a kinsman, but even then, the, I guess the, the seed had been planted and, it, and it, it kind of blossomed already. So um, the idea is out there, play with it. And Gary really wants to talk about Gaines Mill and Cold Harbor. So I think we ought to let him do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with Carol. And, and to answer her question, the, the picture that got me going was the one that Brian brought up. And that's the May 3rd, 1863, Andrew Russell picture of the Stonewall at Fredericksburg. And, and I just wanted to know more about why, you know, why did that take place? So that was the first first thing that I saw and, and dove into it um, and, and learned a lot more about it. Hey, uh, I'll encourage everybody watching. Uh, just real quick, everybody watching, put in your photo. I, we'd like to see what one. I'll bet some of you will say the three Confederate prisoners. We'll probably have a few Dunker churches in there, maybe a Massaponex church, Grant at Lookout Mountain. I don't know. Chris? Yeah. The thing that I've always found fascinating about the Gaines Mill Cold Harbor connection, too, is that like the battles are fought perpendicular to each other. So it's the same landscape, but you really have to look at that landscape from literally an entirely different angle in order yeah. to understand what happened there, which then lets you understand those battlefields in fascinating ways uh, and again just to, to to underscore the importance of preservation you know when you have ground like that preserved that then you can go out and walk it understand it literally turn yourself around um the the depth of insight you can get on those battles because you have those battlefields and look at them so differently is is priceless it's it's irreplaceable good and let me say i mean you know you bring up a great point not only are they perpendicular one another, but it's two years apart. The first one did not have earthworks by and large. The second one did. The first one did not have, you know, the enslaved flocking to the army, you know, necessarily in the same way where the second one, everywhere the Union Army went, they were putting the Emancipation Proclamation into effect. I mean, you talk about a difference between the two and make no mistake based on Chris's point, you know, we, the members of the trust, uh, the supporters, I'm a, I'm a donor, um, you know, we have uh, more than quadrupled I'm sorry, six septuple the size of the preserved lands at Gaines's Mill um, at Cold Harbor. We have in the last 10 years more than doubled the preserved land at Cold Harbor. A long way to go to be sure, but we want people to be able to walk from the Cold Harbor Visitor Center to the Gaines Mill battlefield and walk among these battlefields interchangeably. Um, and that, that's really what we want. And lastly, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, not long ago, uh, I was down at Cold Harbor using the American Battlefield Trust new augmented reality app Augmented reality is when you take your phone or your tablet and you take it to a place, uh, in this case, your backyard or a battlefield, you can drop things that aren't there on there. So what, what I'm showing you here um, is you know, a, a, a view from my phone that shows parts of the views like what Carol was showing on the Cold Harbor battlefield, but with my colleague Larry standing there on what I believe is the far, uh, it looks like the far left to me, and our real estate manager, Tom Gilmore, actually you know, sort of behind uh, one of the soldiers. If you were actually using the app, you could hear the video, you could hear the sounds of them digging, you could see them digging, and you could hear flies buzzing around and whatnot. So you should download the uh, Gettysburg AR app because you can use it at other battlefields as well. Uh, they're expensive to make, but we hope to make more for other places. Um, so I was expecting a selfie, a Gary Edelman selfie. Like, look at me, I was here, and look at me here. Man, I'm, I'm blown away. I've lost two bets already. Man, I, I all I can not, think is uh, William Frasanita would be extremely proud of you, Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you know, with these two battles, to, you know, to change 
topics for just a second, same battle, uh, same battles, but different topic. You know, I think that these two battles have a problem, and that is that they have preconceived notions that go along with them too much. I think the general public look at these battles as, okay, Cold Harbor is June 3rd, 1864. It's Grant's big assault. It took 10 minutes, according to some people, an hour, according to others. It is just a massacre. Gaines's Mill. Gaines's Mill is simply George McClellan retreating, 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 and Robert E. Lee showing he's such a good general. And there's so much more to these stories. They're more complex, especially, you know, to start with Gaines's Mill very briefly. You know, you have Fitz John Porter, who is, you know, blacklisted for what happens, you know, at Second Manassas, depending on whose side you come down with. But Fitz John Porter is the best fighting general, at least core level for for George McClellan at that point. And he puts up a heck of a fight, his, his Fifth Army Corps. You have Robert E. Lee, who's trying to put together this mishmash of an army. He doesn't have cores yet. He's kind of has these wings that are kind of working together, not working together. He has far too intricate battle plans that started out at Cheap Mountain in 1861 and is now carrying over into this peninsula campaign. He's someone who's starting to learn how to maneuver an army, but he's putting too many people in one place and he's he's having too far a marches for others. And, you know, it's hard to coordinate that massive attack that finally does come to fruition at, at Gaines's Mill. But it, it's a learning curve. It really is. And it's something that, that there's more to it. And then you get into 64 and you look deeper into what Grant is thinking. And maybe it is Grant making an excuse, but he thought that the Confederates were overextended and he thought that he had found a place in the lines that was weak. Um, and he tried to hammer away. And it also starts showing you the changing face of war, how the Army of the Potomac and the Army of the James are starting to wear down. Senior officers are falling left and right. You're losing 56 brigade commanders over a six week period. Um and now we're going to change and reface the war down towards Petersburg. So there's a lot more to these stories. And I think having seen this time and again with the Amber, old Ambrose Burnside approach at a visitor center, if someone walking through the door going, that guy's an idiot. Well, there's more to Ambrose Burnside. And yeah, he's not a great general. I know that. I've spent enough time to know that. But with these other stories, you know, it's not just Ulysses S. Grant in one assault on June 3rd. And it's not just George McClellan in his retrograde movements, um, you know, towards the James River and changing his base of operations. Um, there's a lot more to it. And I think that that's uh, something that starts to need to, to come to light from, you know, not only some of the great articles that came through, uh, you know, Gary Gallagher's um, Peninsula Campaign book of 1862 and Stephen Sears to the Gates of Richmond and Gordon Ray's works. Um, you know, there, there's more to these stories. And I think that's what they've languished with. It's like, ah, preconceived notions. It's over like that. So what Chris is saying is we should not be afraid of writing traditional military history. There's so many stories that still have to be told. There are so many stories that have been told but have not been told well. There are so many stories of major battles that have not been, um, not had the luxury of being treated with modern historic, historical uh, methodology and access to the records that we have today. There are so many things that are yet to be done and done a whole lot better than they've been done before that for as much as we've talked about civilians and war and society approaches and that sort of thing, there's still plenty of room for traditional uh, battle studies. And it'll have to probably be some of us who take the lead on all that. It probably, th this is not the kind of activity that usually gets a whole lot of traction in the academic world because academic historians, and I'm one of them, by and large, find ourselves um, in a situation where uh, our professional colleagues prefer the um, war and society approach rather than the traditional battle approach. And so sometimes they don't value or respect our work in traditional military history, battle and tac uh, tactics and strategy and that sort of thing as much as we wish they would and as much as they really deserve. Um, so there's still a place for that so I guess some of us got to get busy. I guess now that I'm retired, um, I can think about that now. Retired, Carol. I, 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 I like something. I like something else that that uh, Chris talked about, where he mentioned about how uh, people today see or decide whether or not this is the same place, the same battlefield, things like that. Uh, mentioning um, um, the Cold Harbor, whatever it was in the wilderness, whether they're the same thing or something. But I, of course, I can't help but think of what, what did the soldiers think about being in the same place? Did they identify it as the same place? Uh, Gary, I, I mentioned to you in, in the preparation for this, 
um, the movie No Retreat from Destiny. Um, and uh, I know many people, of course, know other movies like um, you know Gettysburg or whatever. But uh, No Retreat from Destiny is um, the film about 1864, again, the Valley Campaign, which, again, near and dear to me. And there's a scene in that movie where um, when they've crossed the Potomac and they've made it back into Maryland, the Confederates. And by the way, uh, the Stonewall Brigade uh, crossed three times the Potomac. Um, Gordon's Alabamian troops, uh, John Gordon's and Robert Rhodes, those soldiers, and there's many, many others, I'm sure, um, that, that crossed the Potomac three times. But anyway, there was, a, there was a scene in that film where one of the Confederate soldiers says, hey, man, look over there. Lyman died there like two years ago, you know, in Maryland and the Antietam campaign and all. Um, and like, seems like every time we come back up here, we get in a big fight and something bad happens. So I, you just can't help but think about if somebody, maybe it's PTSD or whatever, what came back for them when they went back to the same place, um, seeing someone who they knew who died there, who might still be buried there and how they felt about that. Yeah, there's, there's great accounts of, you know, Chancellorsville, Mine Run, and Wilderness are essentially the same battlefields. They're so close to one another. And in 1864, whenever Grant's and Meade's army cross the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers, they talk about going to Chancellorsville. And, you know, there, there are rookie soldiers with them, and there are veteran soldiers who go over the same exact land. They had, they had been there a year before. And they're literally finding skeletons of men dug up by, you know, wild animals um, of this is where the 110th Pennsylvania fought. This is where 5th Main Battery E uh, was positioned. And they absolutely, they, there are some great accounts of that, Brian. It's a great point that, you know, these guys, not only are they going back to the same place, they're going back to the same killing ground sometimes. And they're seeing um, the detritus of war. Um, and then just to jump in just for a second for what Gary said with the AR app, great app it's a lot of fun not just because i work for the american battlefield trust but i think that the technology has a place um in you know doing the interpretation and one thing that opened my eyes was that we legally did a drone exercise where we took a drone and, and flew it off of some of the trust land down at Gaines's mill and we took off and as we crested the trees i could see the spires of richmond and i never put two and two together even though i could see it on a map when I saw that, it was like, wow, look how close they are. We did the same thing on our land at Malvern Hill, and I could see the James River, and I could see just how close they were. You know, seeing it on a map and being there, and I've been there many times to these battlefields, it was one thing, but just to see the battlefield open up from a different view, and it's like, this is just how close they were. Um, it was fascinating to, to see it not only at Malvern Hill, which is July 1st of 62, first picket's charge, as I call it, and then you have on um, June 27th of 62, just how close those guys were at Gaines's mill. The Fitz John Porter was to, to Richmond. And ironically, when you take off the Union Army's back is to Richmond and the Confederates are attacking towards it. I, I just, let me just jump in because I'm, I'm loving all this. Of course, we need to wrap things up shortly, but um, but first of all, you know, I would, I think I've even seen accounts of soldiers marching on their way to the Grand Review and somehow they went across, you know, Spotsylvania County and, and even referenced it even then when the war is over. There they are seeing some of the result of this terrible conflict. And Chris, you know, I mean, what that drone did was not only provide us with that view, but depending on how high he went, you know, Fitz John Porter soldiers and, uh, 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 aeronauts and E.P. Alexander were both up in balloons, I think at the same time there. So you were able to get the view from not only from, from that specific balloon um, at the time of Richmond. Of course, Richmond has changed a little bit, but I think that's really cool. I, I would be derelict if I didn't mention a book. And I know Chris Mikowski in the chat mentioned one um, to us we might want to talk about. But it doesn't exactly do the military stuff, but I'm a big fan of Megan Kate Nelson's book, Ruin Nation, which takes, you know, sort of landscapes and humans and structures and talks about how the war, you know, affected and ruined them. It's, it's a very good study. And, you know, I, I'm not one who trends away from military studies, like straight up military battle stuff very often. And I adore that book. Chris, uh, I think you brought up one that touches on the subject we were talking about. Sure. Adam Petty has a recent book called The Battle of the Wilderness in Myth and Memory. And it talks about the way soldiers' attitudes about the wilderness evolved between Chancellorsville, Mine Run, and the wilderness. And he really gets into um, kind of this exploration about, um, you know, the intimacy these soldiers have with these battlefields and, and uh, what that does in their psyche and then how that then 
parlays into our modern understanding of those battlefields because of the way those soldiers ended up remembering. Uh, and what I, I really like about that book is at the end, he says that other battlefields could really benefit from that same sort of examination. So that if you looked at, for instance, Manassas and how soldiers' attitudes about it evolved over time, the Shenandoah Valley, how soldiers' attitudes and perceptions evolved over time. Um, so it's a fascinating book uh, and really I recommend it. And to jump onto that just for a second, um, going back to jump to, to those civilians who I said, why don't they leave these places? That The wilderness is a perfect example of why the hell do you keep coming back to try to fight a battle here if you're the Union Army? I'm just I'm just saying, I mean, didn't go well at Chancellorsville, didn't go well at Mine Run. Let's throw Kelly's Ford in there if we really want to. It's close enough. And Brandy Station, those didn't go exactly right. And now we're going to come back for the wilderness. I mean, it's like, man... <laughs> Got to learn. You, you got to learn to go, go right, go left, go somewhere else. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, but since we're wrapping up, uh, one, I guess, last thing I'd like to mention um, is, uh, and, and like I said, again, brainstorming that, that idea about war returning. Um, and I also thought about uh, those um, enslaved men who managed to make it north and to uh, uh, join uh, U.S. CT regiments or maybe even when they did this in the South or whatever. Um, and uh, then they're in the army, but then they may end up coming back to the places that they escaped from to fight. Um, this is kind of shown briefly in Glory. Mm -hmm. And of course I know that, that Glory is really a, a fabrication of uh, a lot, pretty much a compilation of USCT regiments. Uh, most of those uh, men in that regiment were actually from the North, but uh, the moment where as they come down south and they show plantations and stuff, one of the soldiers says, I forgot how hot it was down here. And uh, then Tripp says, welcome home. And that's kind of a reality that, that some of these soldiers were facing this. Um, the other thing, of course, with that is uh, when um, some of these men were in battle and then captured, um, it wasn't just all that they were executed on the field like Fort Pillow or Olusty. Um, but there were occasions of capture, a uh, Sulphur Creek trestle in September 1864 and some other cases. Um, I do know of the story, um, and I've heard this, I guess actually might have happened more than once, but uh, one man, um, an Abram Rawls, I don't have his regiment, but his capture included where he was um, recaptured by the man who enslaved him before, and he was basically dragged back to or forced to march back to the plantation that he came from or the farm or whatever. But what's interesting is, is that before he got there, uh, some mile or so before he got there, um, his enslaver took his uniform off and put him in um, slave clothes because he didn't want the other enslaved people on the plantation or whatever to see that this man was a Union soldier. And that, that's the interesting thing. I mean, so many accounts I've seen of uh, Confederates um, in diaries and stuff never refer to uh, African American soldiers as soldiers. It's always, uh, uh, well, everything else. But anyway, um, that's I did want to mention that that um, the war returns for them in many cases who have come from the South, gone north or gone to the army, joined the army in in Tennessee or wherever, uh, Camp Nelson, Kentucky, and then end up coming back to places in the South to fight. And um, what's that other famous story where, um, or anecdote, maybe it's a Shelby Foot story or whatever, where um, uh, USCT soldier sees his master in a group of prisoners. Hey, bottom rail on top this time, master, so. Yeah, I mean, David Blight does a great job in, in his Race and Reunion book de describing this, you know, when some of these USCTs coming back during occupation duty uh, to the old places where they were, you know, once, you know, in bondage. There's others that uh, you take the other side of the coin with the white population trying to wrestle, especially after the war, with the fact that either they now have to pay these people uh, a living wage or they're now under occupation of it. It's a fascinating two-way street to, to see, you know, how both sides of that coin are, are wrestling with that. And that, that's yeah. a great, great point, Brian. It's, you know, and it takes a lot to say, I'm going to go join this army and I'm going to march back to where I was, you know, in bondage. And 
not only risk my life, but risk re-enslavement before I go. I mean, it, 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 there's more to that that story. It's so mo- so much more complex of why people fight these these wars on all sides, and that one's really one you have to wrestle with if you're uh, you know a USCT soldier. And, and that's the theme of the day, and and things that we we just have. I mean, a, a, a Chris keeps saying there's more to the story because there is. We're we're just trying to touch on some of these things. So I want to wrap it up. But I want to give Carol the last word. She took us off. So do you have anything else to add, Carol? Well, we've been talking about when war returns, and we've been focusing between the years 1861 and 1865, maybe a little bit of 1866. But the very fact that we are here today talking about it means that we have returned to the war ourselves. It's not something that's limited to the Civil War generation. It's something that is part of our national heritage. It's, it's come down to us. We are here because somehow the war has still returned. Um. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol Reardon, Dr. Chris Mikowski, my colleague, Chris White, and Brian Cheeseboro, who among five, four other bespectacled people wins the contest for most Civil War appearing glasses um, of, <laughs> you didn't even yes. know the contest, <laughs> of the Zoom. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, to everybody uh, for watching, uh, for all your engaging questions, and of course, for supporting battlefield preservation and education.